So we're just going to do, I think, you know, probably we need a bit of compassion. So we're just going to do about 10 minutes of meditation simply because, yeah, this is the last class. So, well, you know, congratulations. All, I think most of you have been joining or listening online if we've been busy with something, yeah? <laughs> Dana, were you listening to some of the classes online? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. All of the classes. Okay, yes, great. Yes. Yeah, so either way, that's wonderful, yeah. So let's spend a couple of minutes then just settling the mind. Getting into the body. A couple of deep inhalations, exhalations, whatever we need just to kind of settle and be pre as present as possible, as aware, as clear as possible for the class. In that space, just take a moment to clarify, kind of form your own motivation for the class. What kind of spontaneously comes up in the mind when we think about our motivation for the class? And maybe you want to add to that as well, just a bit, create it a little bit more clearly. So both together. So as I said before, the whole Lamrim practice, each topic we go through, as we touch on each topic and feel a little bit and understand each topic, slowly the idea is when we start to transform our motivation for life, you know, into one that maybe before we met the spiritual teachings was mostly concerned with getting comfort, security, certainly still having a kind heart, but more centred around finding a sort of level of happiness and security within this life, you know. But that much more we go through the lamb rim, integrate it into our being, that much more that motivation will start to shift and transform. So we become what we call more of an inner being. Especially in the light of the teachings on death and impermanence really get into grips with the fact that we live in uncertainty all the time. We have this feeling of things being certain. This is going to happen, that's going to happen. But especially in the light right now, this time for some of us, you know, when we're going through these, this time of elections, there's a lot of uncertainty, great amount of uncertainty. We don't really know how it's going to go. Maybe there's a bit of anxiety around that. A bit of fear. In this world right now, there's an incredible amount of uncertainty. We can see so much change and shift happening on a global level. But the uncertainty we're mainly working with now is getting that feeling of the uncertain time of your death. That place we need to go back to at the end of our life. That journey we need to take at the end of our life. And as much as possible, being unprepared for that uncertainty and that process. First of all, educating ourselves what that process really is, you know, what and what comes out of that process, rebirth. And how best we can equip, equip ourselves for the time when we have to go into the death state, we have to 
reach that final destination in your lives. So just in the situation of elections or any kind of storm or difficulty coming in our life, we need to be, we have to kind of have this strong strength of mind, strength of will. That comes through developing our mind in the, the Lam Rim, the path to enlightenment. Especially developing these wings of wisdom and compassion. So that much more we understand our own suffering, the suffering of others. That much more our wing, our heart of compassion will open for ourselves and others. Because the deeper we understand our own suffering, the deeper we'll be able to understand others and have a deeper, more genuine sense of not just kindness, but compassion for others. That's what awakens in the process of Lam Rim. That genuine compassion, understanding our own and all being suffering, you know, this place, a continual death and rebirth that we're in, cyclic existence. So it's a real revelation, you know, if we haven't heard these teachings before, we're just starting to digest them. It's incredible to have access to these and really be able to investigate our own suffering in this deeper way and find a deeper solution to not just this life, but all future life's problems. And be able to awaken a deeper sense of compassion for others and also awaken the same potential for wisdom we have that's the main one that gets us out of this cycle of death and birth. Where we start we in this process, as we're doing now, is taking a sense of refuge and our potential to achieve that. And in a greater refuge right now in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha. Relying on them to guide us in this process and to help us develop our mind so we have this strength in mind at the death time and gradually building up our strength in mind, the wisdom and compassion to liberate ourselves for the cycle of death and rebirth altogether so we can liberate and benefit all sentient beings. So that's a big picture. So tonight we're just going to really think about what refuge means. Just taking a moment in that space, thinking about refuge, our objects of refuge, their qualities to guide us. Because that's what we can always go back to, our own state of mind, you know, the outer refuge that embodies all the qualities. And an inner refuge is our ability to develop those qualities within us. No matter what the storm is out there, no matter the uncertainty, we have to just take refuge in our state of mind, you know, and rely on objects of refuge who are infallible, who can guide us through temporary storms and the ultimate storm is samsara, karma and delusion. So on behalf of all beings and with all beings, we just um, start the class just by reciting the refuge prayer together, feeling we're all taking refuge in that innate ability to liberate ourselves and also the qualities of the enlightened holy beings, the incredibly clear teachings of the Buddha Dharma, and also the spiritual community who can kind of nurse and support us through their process uh, in our transformation. We can just visualize Chen Rizig as our object of refuge, embodying all these three qualities. And just when we recite the refuge, light and nectar just filling us up and giving us this kind of clarity and inspiration to hear and understand and reflect on the class. <laughs> Chan ju bardu da ni kyab su chi da gi chin so gi pe so nang ye drola 
Pengir sange ju parsho sange Chodan sogi chogdam lai chan ju bardu dagni kyap su chi Dagi chan sogi be so namgi Jola pengir sange ju parsho I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. Okay, so as I said, first, we're just doing a shorter, sorry, motivation tonight, uh, meditation, just so we can hopefully finish the materials tonight. Although, as I say, next week, for the couple of you who joined a couple of minutes after seven, we will have, as they sent out, the discussion group and the we're, we also have the practice day as well. So <clears throat> we'll have time to discuss a bit more during those two, both those times as well. Let's do some meditations. Okay, let me just take a moment to get the slide together. The PowerPoint. Okay, good. So uh, just to begin, we just to briefly uh, go over again the um, what we finished, kind of finished, I went over it quite quickly last week, but just to kind of cover again, I mean, it's quite, I find it one of the most interesting teachings in the Dharma is the death process for me personally. So I just wanted to sort of flip through it again. And um, so you get an idea again, as I say, during the, the practice day, we will also go do a meditation on the death process. Um, so again, just kind of flipping through the appearances that happen um, when we actually sort of hit the time so one of the main signs when we start to go through the, the death process externally, whether it's ourselves or others, um, is the main sign that we start to see. So if we start to see that in someone else who's starting to pass away, this is when we're hitting the time when we just have possibly like minutes or a few hours left to live. It could even happen over two or three days, this process. It, it happens a little bit differently for everyone. But the main sign that, that someone's moving into the death process is that we can no longer open or close our eyes. And what we're seeing here is the inner signs that start to happen. So as I mentioned last week, these uh, great you know meditators, um, they actually practice at certain times, and we'll see in the f uh, future slides when there's particular times where you can practice now, but we can also just practice in general meditation, you know. They practice um, imagining, it's at the level of imagination, going through this process. So before, what we meditated on to remind us of death was the nine-point death process. Well, another way of reminding ourselves, nine-point nine point death meditation that we went through previous classes. Another way, more esoteric way, of reminding ourselves on a daily basis or on a regular basis that we're going to pass away is actually doing this meditation on the death process. And it's generally, as I said last week, it comes for the teachings of High Yoga Tantra. So for beings like His Holiness and other beings, I mean, we all have, you know, some of us have commitments from High Yoga Tantra. So actually one of our commitments is, is to actually practice this death process. And it's as I say, it's the level of imagination for most of us, but just bring it, you know, when we go deeper into meditation to try and imagine and think, okay, imagine we're dying and what would be the first sign that comes into our appearance? And it's, an, a, it's a mental image, it's not a visual image. And the first thing that happens when our body starts to get heavy and we, we lose kind of the ability to move our body, the first sign, inner sign that happens is the this process of a mirage on a day. So it's not really on a desert as such. It's mostly what we see. This is the closest I could get, as I said last week, to finding something online of a mirage. You always see it in a desert, but it's like the same idea. Um, this kind of the water, because the water, the water element is becoming more, the earth element is absorbing in our body and it absorbs into the water element. So the water element becomes a bit more kind of not stronger but more kind of uh, more vital 
It's more vital at that moment in the earth element. And so what happens is we see this appearance of um, a mirage. So for meditators, they will know, okay, now I'm moving into the death process. I know it because of the physical signs in the body, the earth, the, the body becoming heavy. And in the inner sign is the appearance of a mirage. And for meditators, they would meditate on the emptiness. So the whole point of being aware at this at our level of having awareness of the death process or for, for us, certainly it's helpful because we'll start to know we can prepare our mind with whatever preparations we may or may not have done at the death time, whatever kind of meditation or set thought we want to bring to mind. If we know these processes, we'll know that we're going to, once these visions start to happen, we know we're going in, we're definitely moving into a death process and whatever, again, whatever mental state we've pre ideally prepared for the death time, we want to bring it to mind now. That's the whole process. The reasoning for us to know these visions is so we can prepare our mind to have, you know, that mental state of, you know, we try and bring about that mental state. For meditators, they're actually meditating for sort of yogis, what they do with these visions is they try to meditate on emptiness because the ultimate goal for them is when they are moving to the most subtle level of consciousness, what we'll get to now is the clear light level of consciousness. They want to use that to meditate on emptiness. And of course, as we get into the module on emptiness, you'll, you'll discover a bit more what that means. Some of us know already, but that's the kind of goal for great meditators is they want to get to this most subtle level of mind because it's the most powerful for a generating, a, a, at least meditating their emptiness and ideally developing a realisation, a deep experience of emptiness that can liberate you at the time of death. So the earth elements dissolve. The next the next one that arises is the um, this appearance. So that one starts to absorb, that appearance of the mirage. And then what it is replaced by is appearance is smoke filled room or incense filling a room. And again, that's all that appears to the mind. It's like we're in a room that's filled with smoke and that appearance is happening because now the water element is absorbing into the fire element. So the fire element becomes more sort of prominent and you have this, this um, vision of fire. So again, for meditators, they're very familiar with this process. So they then they say, okay, now I'm moving into another level of consciousness and um, the, you know, the fire elements absorbing, the water elements absorbing into the fire, our mouth starts to dry up and there's other kind of signs. And the main one is we see the vision in the mind is this it's smoke. Um, without me putting up the next one, does anyone, maybe anyone here familiar with uh, this process? Does anyone know, <laughs> just testing a little bit, what the next one is, the next vision? Earth, any hands? I'm looking around. I Just think fireflies here. is the next one. Those sparks, fireflies. <laughs> well done, Earth. Great. Yeah. So, and why does the fireflies happen? What's happening there? What 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 um, elements are absorbing into which elements? I, I mean, the the water element kind of finishes to work, and then the next one, the fire element, becomes active. The fire element, yes. Yeah, so. What happens here is when the fire flat then so again we have this element this the same um, vision and so the next one once the the vision of the smoke starts to disappear what comes more prominent well it's actually the this one is actually dissolution of the fire element earth into the wind element so what becomes more active here is the wind element it's not active but it's it's um, it's still holding a power that the fire element doesn't because the fire's um, sort of absorbed into the wind element so we have this appearance of like fireflies or like sparks from a fire you know and it's just kind of black with this fire like firefly appearance so again we're going into like we're absorbing grosser levels of consciousness here so that's the third one that appears to the mind and again for great meditators they're very it's like lucid dreaming they're very present with this process. And again, some of us, even in our lifetimes, occasionally <laughs> we can, you know, have experiences. Um, I mean, there's times when we go through these kinds of mini dissolutions in our life, which we'll come into in the future slide and uh, towards the middle of the class. Next one, Urs. <laughs> You're getting tested uh, tonight. <laughs> yes, uh, I think the candlelight is coming up. 
or yes. flickering candlelight, something like that. Yeah, you're right. So actually, the main one, the main description I read, it's like a flickering of a candle, but what's actually more clear according to Zong Rinpoche, and again, sometimes you get slightly different interpretations, you know, but what's quite prominent is the blue-red light. So you see the flickering flame, but there's this blue-red, and I managed to find a picture like that online. There's a sort of blue-red um, light that's around it as well. So this is what happens when the 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 grosser wind element absorbs and we go start to move into a more subtle level of consciousness this is when the breathing stops this is the last vision we see before the breathing stops and again this is where clinically in western medicine then we would be i you know they think that we believe they believe we're dead you know but in in, in terms of the tibetan buddhist teachings we've just uh, we've just absorbed the elements in our body, the aggregates and aggregates and other factors. But we've still got three main, we've still got different levels of subtle consciousness to absorb before we actually, you know, the, the consciousness leaves the body. Um, so here, what we're, what's happening here is uh, we're actually going into sort of more subtle body meditations. So again, I showed this last week and we've seen this before. I think I showed this during the How to Meditate class, the kind of images of the subtle body where we have. So in the subtle body, we have chakras, winds and drops. So what's happening is these levels of wind or consciousness are moving into these the subtle body and moving into the central channel there. So again, you can find more detailed descriptions in some of the readings that I've sent, How to Enjoy Death by Lama Zoparimshi has a great description there of what goes through, what the process is, what we're going through. It would kind of take a whole, you know, maybe a couple of classes to go in at real depth. So I just wanted to focus mostly on the visions now. And we did explain a little bit more last week, the, the kind of grosser level of the absorptions. But this is what's happening here when we go into subtle level of the consciousness. Ladan, do you have a question? You raised your hand. Yes, yes, I have a question. There, there was uh two stages. I think that you have a like a um sunset vision. Yes, we're not. We're getting there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you. just yeah, yeah. We're still we're still not finished dying yet. We're still <laughs> sorry. I'm just explaining that um. That was the grosser level of consciousness that we just, gross consciousness that we just absorbed. So now we're going into subtle consciousness, but which this absorption happens in this level of much more subtle body in the central channel. So I'm just showing you that. So you're right. There's three more visions that still have to happen. So what's the first one, Urs? Or someone else? Well, there's this white appearance coming. Yeah, the white appearance, yeah. So this white appearance happens because, just in a nutshell, eh, sorry, I missed the, where's the slide there? And again, it's similar to the kind of white appearance, like a clear, vacuous sky that happens maybe in the autumn time when we've had a fresh, flow of, um, fresh fall of snow and that kind of white appearance kind of reflects in the sky. It's, that's about the best I could find, you know, of this kind of whiteness of the sky, but it's vacuous, it's like clear, empty. This happens because um, certain winds have dissolved into the central channel and, and we have, so the substances that we receive for the ma mother and father at the death time, what it, they abide, there's a part of it abides on the crown and part in the, the navel chakra. So the, the white substances for the father, what happens is these the, the winds start to absorb into the central channel and they melt the crown, the substance on the crown, and that moves towards the the kind of um, seed, indestructible drop that we have at the heart, and it absorbs into the heart. And so, because there's it absorbs our conscious, our consciousness gets absorbed with this kind of white appearance from that that substance that we have already in the subtle body. So again, for meditators, they know now this is then going into the more subtle level. Not the most subtle, it's called the subtle level. The previous appearances all happen because we were just absorbing gross consciousness. Here we're absorbing subtle consciousness. So these are kind of the three 
appearances of absorbing subtle consciousness till we get to the very subtle consciousness of clear light. And the next, so then we have this white appearance for meditators. Again, they're meditating on the emptiness. They're trying to recognize the emptiness of that appearance. For us, if we're lucky enough, we'll just be able to <laughs> um, maybe have some awareness that this is happening, you know, and keep some sort of, I mean, at that level, we don't really have a conceptual mind going on. Uh, but um, possibly if we're skilled enough, we may be able to recognize these appearances if we train enough. The next one, Urs? Uh, this red vision. Yeah. So we have the red vision next. That's like a sort of autumn sky or a copper. Again, very clear and vacuitous, but it's a clear, it's like an autumn uh, red sort of copper sky. And again, this can, um, you know, it, uh, this, this is happening because the substance from the mother, the sort of blood at the navel, um, again, is pushed up through the winds moving through the central channel. And it goes again to the, 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 the indestructible drop at the heart. And what happens, the consciousness get absorbed in this red appearance because this red substance is moving in to the uh, heart chakra. Oh, I forgot to ask you. But anyway, <laughs> Urs knows, he knows them all. Next one is the black, what we call near attainment. So for great meditators, they're like, they know that they're very close now. The next appearance, what's going to come manifest is the most subtle mind of clear light. So this is the last appearance of the subtle consciousness he's absorbing. And it's almost like here they say you go into a bit of a swoon and it's a bit like, I mean, we don't go this subtle at the, the dream time, but not the dream time. When we go to sleep, some of us just sort of zonk out into this black space, you know. It's a little bit like that, but not as subtle when we're dreaming. So we go into this sort of blackness and there's a kind of swooning that happens here. So the meditators see this clear black sort of nighttime sky but then there's a time when they sort of swoon and then they need to be able to be there because after that swooning, then it's like the, the, we move into this uh, mind of clear light consciousness. Like an auto, it's kind of like, um, like they say it's like dawn time, you know, this clear vacuous space where the, the sun, it's not completely up, but there's this clarity and it's... Um, it's the most powerful state of consciousness that we have, you know? So this happens for everybody at the death time. The main thing is, is whether we're able to recognize it. And the bigger thing is, is what, you know, can we really be in the process and meditate on it at the death time? So again, for, for many of us, we can be in that state, just ordinary beings can be in this most subtle level of clear light consciousness, even if we're not aware if we have a lot of virtue, good karma, we can stay in that le that place for up to three days, even though we're not aware. And so generally they say the longer you're in it, it's most likely because you've had a good, you know, virtuous life. So that, that consciousness, that purity, you've empowered that in this life through the power of your virtue. So even we can't meditate, but we might still be in that very peaceful, pure state, which is our ultimate nature. We can rest in that for up to three days, even though we can't meditate on it. We, we might be in that place for days. For great meditators, um, His, His Eminence Ling Rinpoche, some of you met him possibly this time. Uh, I know some of us did. When he came, the, his reincarnations, and he's 38 now, but in his previous incarnation, His Eminence Ling Rinpoche, in his previous incarnation, was the tutor for this present Dalai Lama. Um, so he meditated in the clear light sp space for uh, 13 days. I mean, some beings stay in it for longer, you know, for up to, you know, can be weeks and months. One of my other teachers who I received ordination from, my Getzel vows, he was in the, I think he was in the state for 16 days. So again, this is all because they they have control they've had developed this ability to be able to meditate in during the lifetime on these subtle levels of consciousness for so for them like they can't wait you know 
it might be like somebody who's some, done some sort of training for something in this life, you know, so you feel so adapt and uh, adept and so well trained, you can't wait to go out and like, I don't know, run a marathon or do a bike race, because you know, like you're going to do really well, you know, <laughs> even if you might not win, but you, you've, you're so well trained, you know, so there's no fear. And it's kind of like, you almost can't wait, because this is the opportunity for you to be able to use that subtle consciousness, because it's so subtle, it's so fine and refined, that it's, easy to me it's it's the best place to get a, a, a direct perception a realization of emptiness and actually liberate oneself from birth and death in this process um so that's one way for meditators to realize emptiness and there's the different subtleties as well of emptiness you know so that's why it requires this this most subtle level of consciousness is when you're going to get the deepest experience or realization of the nature of consciousness, nature of emptiness. And that's what where we can actually free ourselves the future sort of ordinary rebirth in this place. So as I said last week, it's for like great yogis who have familiarized ourselves. It's like, you know, it's like lucid uh, dream. Like it's they're dying in a very clear, clean, clear space. They have control of the process. As I said about Lama Yeshi, Rimshi said about Lama Yeshi, he's on top of death. He's on top of that process. He's kind of got it in his pocket or something, you know. So they become masters of that process. So, and His Holiness says at the end of the period during which the subtlest mind remains in the body. So after the meditation finishes, or whether we're meditating or whether we we're coming out of that process, there's a slight movement of the wind. So again, this process, our our mind is always together with a level of wind that's happening all the time so certainly at this most subtle time of death there's a slight movement of the wind on which the mind that clear light rides and then it opens up because it, it comes out of this drop a uh, open drop of white and red constituents of the heart and it exits the body so that's for for a uh, in the according to tibetan buddhism that's the that's the actual moment of death so for beings who die violently, of course, or in accidents, this process can happen very, very, very quickly, you know. So ideally, we don't want to have that happen to us at the death time. We want to have a, an ability to be able to kind of be as present as possible with the death process and, de and, have a, and develop or have a certain positive or virtuous state of mind. Ladan, you have a question? Yes, I have a question that... Um, about this uh, process of uh, mm -hmm. death, but I don't know if it's very um, technical. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is the the karma that you have created like to be born in a lower realm? If uh, this this karma uh, cha can change this this levels, like for example. If uh, the the drop goes into the your heart chakra or down to the I don't know to another chakra, lower chakra, is it uh, in the um, relation? Uh, in, it, can, it can be changed if you have a bad strong karma. Well, we will discuss that. Can we leave that till we go through the rest of the class, Ladan? Because it might be answered in the rest of the class. And if not, bring it up. We can discuss it again. Is that okay? Ladan? Yes, because I was cut my... I had cut okay. my voice. Yeah, yeah so thank you. Just, let's no, see, it was just we'll... rise up, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I of understand. Course. And it's a good question, because I think we'll get to that as we go through states of mind that we need to develop, and we'll, we'll, we should get there, hopefully. So, um, you know, as His Holiness says, this is a, a mapping of deeper states of mind that occur. So we actually go through the, some of these states of mind on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, again, if we have a presence or a certain ability to meditate or be aware, we can maybe catch some of these um, phases in our daily life. So when we go through these phases, again, and again, the phases mean the appearances of, you know, these like the mirage, the fireflies, the white, the red, the, the, you know, these eight appearances, 
we actually go through them when we go in and out of grosser and subtle levels of consciousness that happens on a you know it happens to us daily you know and in, in, or sorry often ordinary activities like going to sleep ending a dream so the eight phases proceed in a forward level when we go to sleep so this is like what we just what i just mentioned you know that's the forward level dying going to sleep ending a dream sneezing fainting or during orgasm so that that those all happen very very quickly though so it's very hard for us to get a, you know maybe be aware or get a handle on them but we actually go through these many states um as in um, in the same order during these times and in a reverse order so the reverse order again that means um instead of what we would do is we come out of the you know sort of a subtle level like maybe not clear like consciousness but a subtle level in mind and we go through in a reverse order instead of we go through the dark the red the white then it would be the um the candle flame the fireflies the um the smoke and the mirage are we there <laughs> So we go through them in that order during these occasions, after the process of death ends, when waking from sleep. So otherwise, after the process of death means when we go into the bardo, when we take a bardo body, we go in there. We, they, they happen in a, that uh, the other opposite order. When waking from sleep, when beginning a dream, when sneezing, fainting, or again, when orgasm ends. So... It's quite a lot to get our head around, I think. <laughs> but um, are we kind of there? <laughs> you know, they happen in one way, one order when we're dying and then the opposite order um, in these situations, you know. So again, for meditate, and the main one that it's easiest to recognise is because, you know, sneezing and fainting or even orgasm, it's not really easy because it's they don't, they don't happen so clearly. You know, all of these ones... It's, they're very, very fast, but there is a, a level of, of course, when we sneeze, <laughs> it's a very quick process. So temporarily what's happening is you do a short, it's a very small dissolution there, and then you come back out of it in the reverse order when you finish sneezing, you know. So, um, so I had one friend uh, who fainted another, another, oh, sorry, what happened there? Went to the wrong one. She she went into, maybe I mentioned this last week, when she was in the presence of his holiness, she fainted and went into a more subtle, she was aware that she went into a more subtle, I think she managed to see the white appearance or something when she was around, when he, she was with his holiness. Did I mention this last week? Anyone remember? <laughs> B? Where are you? Yes, yes. You, you I did here. mention it, sorry. So I won't go over it again, but either way, um, so I think um, that, you know, the, the last few, it's very hard to recognize. So for meditators, what they try to do is use the sleep time and the dream time. So when you're going to sleep and then moving into a dream, they try to use those times to meditate, to, to try and get awareness of that process, to build up an awareness. So through the power of their meditation, they're able to control dreams, move in and out of dreams, recognize the processes when you move from sleep to the dream state and back again into the waking state and again if they're able to sort of control or manage that they then they recognize that as a sign that they're going to be able to meditate um on the death the process of death at the death time because they're able to sort of meditate and uh, have these kind of lucidity in their dreams and moving in and out of the sleep state of this process so that's um, that's kind of you know where you know if we want to get a sense of these practices and get us you know actually feel like we may be able to meditate on them, it's that's where we often start. Or for those of us again who have taken tantric initiations, um, especially in the realm of high yoga tantra, that's where we can start to practice and um, these types of meditations and moving into the clear light just through the power of these praxis, how they're set up. We actually meditate on a daily basis 
on you know these death states even though it's maybe at the level of visual you know sort of imagination but just getting familiar and reminding ourselves this is what's going to happen at the death time and am I able going to recognize them and maybe be able to get some deeper experience or recognition of the emptiness in my mind of consciousness you know and use that to liberate ourselves from birth and death So, for example, one story, Lama, Lama Yeshe, um, uh, you know, our founder, he used to, there's a story Lama Zoparim, she said that the, Lama Yeshi used to leave a lot of his texts open around his room. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think one, at one point, I don't know if one student asked or Rimpe, Lama Zoparim, she just brought it up, but he, he said that Lama Yeshi when he was going into the dream state, because the other thing you can do, so the whole purpose of doing these meditations, especially what well, we could say first at the level of dream state, is to be able to um, come out, no, go, not go into ordinary bardo state, in a state where we go in an or, ordinary rebirth, but to kind of develop a sort of dream body that can... Um, actually come out of the body and it's going to be similar to that which we do at the death time of a pure body so Lama, Lama Yeshi would say that um, Rinpoche, you know, Rinpoche would say that Lama left all his texts open because when he was he went and when he was looking like he was sleeping he was actually going into these very subtle levels of consciousness and arising from the dream state in a body and few bodies that could go and read the texts so while he looked like he was sleeping, he was actually reading many texts. And you can do that <laughs> when you've developed, you've, you're able to manipulate and utilize these subtle levels of consciousness. You can arise as a sort of dream body or not just one, but many that can benefit others. And also as Lama was doing in that state, he was going out and using it to kind of read many texts at the one time instead of just one. So it's incredible. I mean, we don't have a t time really to cover it in these classes, but what one can do when we, we you leave, you, you kind of touch these subtle levels of consciousness is quite amazing. And of course, we know in ordinary people can, many people can do lucid dreaming, you know, not many people, but there are people who, non-Buddhists who have ability to do lucid dreaming and maybe, you know, arise as a body and go here and there and this and that in their dreams. But for and in terms of Buddhism, the main purpose is, is to realize the nature of consciousness or to use our dream time to receive teachings, to read more, to use that dream state when the, the consciousness is more subtle, it's more pliable, it's easier to move around, to use that to create virtue. So, I mean, it'd be incredible if we can get control of our dreams, you know, because you can more quickly get realizations, more quickly develop the mind if you can use the sleeping and dream state as well. So it'd be wonderful. So that's the that's the main point in the Buddhist tradition, to not to just kind of have a lot of fun in your lucid dreaming. I met a couple of guys when I was very young, new in the Dharma, and these two young, I was I think I was leading some meditations at Copan. I was still quite new, but I was helping lead some meditations for introductory courses there at our monastery in Nepal. And these two young, they were about similar ages. I mean, they had done this lucid dreaming course somewhere in the East. So they were telling me all the things they were able to do in their dreams. And I thought, well, that's amazing. But it was more like flying here and going there and doing leaps and doing gymnastics and doing this. So I thought, well, that's wonderful. But best <laughs> is if you can use it to create virtue, you know, use that ability, um, uh, to that quality to be able to really utilize your dreams to create virtue for yourselves and others. You know, that's the, that, that's the ideal for a Buddhist practitioner. So again, once we get out of this dream, you know, so, you know, we're in our body and we've moved into the most subtle levels of consciousness. And then as His Holiness said, then that through the movement of a subtle wind, the mind moves out of the body. And that's when we move into, for most of us, we're going to move into after the clear light of death due to why do we go into the body, into the bardo? Because we're so accustomed to feel like it being familiar with a sense of eye you know we, we've had a sense of eye all our life and so what creates fear at the time of death is of course leaving the body and also just the dissolution the, the disappearance of this sense of eye that we're so familiar with 
So due to clinging to our own concept of I, we crave form. We, we, we identify ourselves strongly with, with being attached to some sort of form, you know. And due to that, we're reborn in a bardo body similar to the one that we're going to take rebirth in. So again, why that happens, Ladan, is it will hopefully cover, we're still going to get there, you know, why we end up in the bardo body. And of course, we understand that more as we go through the courses, but mostly it happens due to this very strong sense of self that we carry with us throughout our life, you know, the strong sense of I, the wrong concept of I, according to the Buddhist tradition. And due to that, we crave form. And due to that, we arise in a bardo body. But the bardo body is not... the So that bardo state, we go into up to a period of 49 days. It can be shorter than that, depending on our karma. So if we arise in a bardo body similar, immediately similar to the one that we're going to take rebirth in, it's possible that bardo state will be shorter it might only be seven days, 14 days, because every seven days in the bardo, you, you, you sort of dissolve and again, take rebirth. But again, it can be a similar body. So this whole, this process of going through the bardo is quite complicated. But in a general way, um, it's it can be up to 49 days. And every seven days, we sort of we take another rebirth. Again, most of the time it's similar to the one, the main one that we're going to take after we've been through the state of the, bar the Bardo state. And um, for most of us, depending again on the rebirth we're going to take, the Bardo can be quite uh, terrifying because even though everything's appearance in our mind, a lot of the time it's kind of more fearful appearances because we haven't sort of settled into a rebirth yet. So at Rinpoche's house, we used to do this practice and we're going to do it over the weekend, Terry, called sewer practice. Because sometimes bardo beings, they can also be like called smell eaters. And um, depending on the bardo, it depends on the rebirth you're going to take. But they can be spirits, smell eaters, different types of bardo beings. So we used to do this practice where we would offer um, flour, we burn flour and it helps, and we do some prayers, and it sort of attract bardo beings and help to nourish them, smell eaters through that state, and prayers for, and it, you also do prayers for them to find a good future rebirth. So that's called the practice of sewer, and she wanted us to do to sort of benefit the bardo beings as they go through that process, which for most of them is quite, you know, quite, it's for mostly it can be quite terrifying. So, um, I mean, the karma that we're going to take is, yeah, anyway, let's go into that a little bit further on. So, for but so again, for holy beings who meditate on, who have strong meditation power as they go into the clear light, at that level of clear light, they don't, so when that subtle wind, when the consciousness leaves the body, they move into a, a sort of, they can move into a pure rebirth, a, a pure not a rebirth as such, but they would move into, like Lamazon Kappa, for example, he used the meditation at the death time to arise as what we can see as um, an enjoyment body or the body of a Buddha. So again, this, this place, a clear light, is a place for great meditators where they can move themselves out of an ordinary birth into what we could say an exalted birth, you know, a, a birth in a pure realm, a birth as a, a you know, a... a um, and to, to develop what we call this enjoyment body, the Buddha, the Sambhogakaya aspect of the Buddha. And these are all, again, become more, You, these are the terms that you'll find out more about when, in the practice of Tantra. But the main pro practice of Tantra is to transform death, this practice of the intermediate, this point of the intermediate state or the bardo and rebirth into what we call the three bodies of the Buddha. Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and um, Nirmanakaya. These are the three things that are, that are sort of the aims of really Buddhist practitioners, meditators, and to use these times when the mind's very, very subtle to develop these higher levels of um, being, you know, higher level of body to, and to liberate oneself for the cycle of death, death and rebirth altogether. So someone like His Holiness, for example, will meditate on this process, the death process, and also these and these levels of body um, that I mentioned, um, 
kind of form form and uh, bodies of the Buddha Buddha bodies. He they meditate that on that up to seven or eight times a day because they have the commitments with different practices they've done to meditate on these states and become familiar with them. So again, when the mind leaves the body, um. So generally, some of the signs you can see at death, if you have a friend who's passing, you know, maybe you're with someone when they pass, just at our level, there are some things we can maybe determine uh, from the way that the um, person's sort of, you know, the, the heat leaves the body. So generally, um, there can be a sign of the when the heat leaves the body from the lower part of the body first, that can often be a sign that the person's going to have a higher rebirth. When the heat starts to leave the body from the higher, the, the top of the body, that can often be a sign. That can be a sign that the person's going to have a lower rebirth. So most of us won't be able to see unless you have kind of special sight, <laughs> some sort of clairvoyance. Most of us won't be able to see where the mind leaves the body. But generally, it's stated in the teachings that when that subtle consciousness leaves the body, so if it leaves through the crown, then that's a sign that we're going to be born in a pure land. And again, this comes a little bit later in the session as well. When it leaves through the eye, so you can see here, these are higher rebirths, you know, these two, when it leaves through the eyes. So again, that, that would coincide with the, first of all, the, the heat leaving through the lower part of the body. So then, you know, if we're, the subtle consciousness leaves through the crown, it's um, a sign indication that that person's going to be born in the pure land, leaving through the eyes, again, upper part of the body, that they're going to be born a human. But these three are all the lower level of the body, I guess, maybe not the mouth though. Um, but anyway, this is generally, it's not always the case as well here, but this is some, I did see this somewhere, so I thought we'd just mention it. There's so there's the consciousness can leave through these other orifices if um, and show, give an indication that these are the other realms that's um <clears throat> someone maybe could be reborn in, you know, if it leaves these three areas. So during so this is maybe a little bit more. Ladan, we were going to answer your question. Does anyone have any questions? Or I um, know it's quite, I mean, this co process is quite complicated. One does need to do the reading and sort of go through it more thoroughly to get a really good idea of it. Um, any other questions? Um, Robin well, has a question. Robin, yeah. Yeah, I just have one. Um, is there a a reason a person would come back into their body after having this experience? Like, is there any teaching about why you would come back into your own body? Um, there's not, uh, it's not so much why, well, I don't know about why, but I, I think I mentioned it when we were going through one of the classes on near-death experiences. Uh-huh. So there, of course, some people have near-death experiences or some people do actually stop breathing and then they come back again, yeah? Yeah, and I did. That's why I was wondering. Oh, okay. So do you have <laughs> do you remember having any of the visions? Well, I was hearing? I was meditating. I had a stroke, a unexpected stroke. And when they came to get me, I just started to meditate and think like, well, maybe this is the time. And yeah. so I remember seeing black with things and then red, but then I came back in the hospital. It was white and then I came back. I woke up in the hospital. Oh, and I don't, I didn't, I wasn't sure I was actually there for a minute, <laughs> you know, and then I was, and I haven't had anything like that since. And I just wondered, like, maybe if I would meditated harder, I would have come back in someone else's body, but I don't know. I did definitely use, I definitely did not panic, but then I just ended up here. So I, I it's, I don't want to personalize. I was just curious if there was any notion of why. Oh, well, it's, inter that. it's very interesting. Thanks for sharing. Um, so do any of those visions that we just talked about, they, they, it sounds like a couple of them might have been familiar. The sparkles, especially um, yeah. the black with the yellow. Yeah. yeah. And then just, uh, just like I, I was trying to paint it actually when I was in Chicago, when my stepfather, oh, okay. when my right, father okay. was going through it. 
Well, that's that's fascinating. Thank you, Robin. We don't often have somebody who's... <laughs> it was <laughs> just a vision. totally bizarre experience. Yeah. Did you stop breathing? Did they tell you you stopped breathing? Um, no, I oh. actually was in the, I was in, uh, my blood pressure went so high that they immediately, they, they put air in me, but okay. I may have at some point before that, but I don't remember. I was, I was not conscious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, no, wonderful, because I actually asked that question last week and I didn't bring it up. I was like, did, does anyone ever experience that either in these dreaming, dying, sleeping? I can or... lucidly dream as well, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, now you know, I mean, maybe you're, that's wonderful because maybe you can use some of this, <laughs> more of the Buddhist teachings to utilize your dreams, you know? That would be um, Anyway, it's wonderful to have somebody here that's, um, you know, can share that experience. Um, so I would say that you just went into a more, obviously, as we can see, you went into a more subtle level of consciousness. It doesn't sound like you went straight in. I mean, there are people, there are stories, I've seen a couple of commentaries where people go right into the clear light and they stop breathing. But due to the power of their virtue or karma, whatever, they come back again. It's a bit about your, it's just, it's very much dependent on your karma. So some people have, a, you know, these experiences, but they still have the karma to live through this life. So they just may have some sort of, uh, you know, sudden experience a death, you know, but still the karma still there. So they come back and, you know, they kind of like still come back into this life. If that makes sense, you know, it's just really dependent on mostly what your karmic, karmic energy is for this life. So I guess it, we would just say it wasn't your karma to die yet, you know. You went into that place, but it wasn't your karma to completely finish this life. You still have some karma to, to, to play out in this life and be in this body. Well, I try to enjoy it every day, so. Yeah, well, I guess when you go through these experiences, it does, I would imagine it makes one much more, um, as we were saying in some other classes, much we appreciate more and more Absolutely. this life when we go into these sort of um, more shocking experiences. Yes. Anyway, thank you for sharing. Any other questions? Stan? Yes. Stan? Yes. Um, the um, the late last list of, of um, um, where the, the rebirth happens goes to versus uh, according to how the life force leaves the body. Um, we're not able to be aware of that in our death process, I, I presume, because we're too subtle in our consciousness. Uh, is that yeah. correct? Yes, it's it's just it's yeah. just kind of sort of maybe information, you know, but there's no way. The main reason why that would make a little bit of sense is we're not going to be aware of that. I mean, and also for holy beings who have already controlled the death process, there's no way they're going to a lower rebirth. They're going up to, <laughs> you right. know, they're going out through the crown or whatever, you know. Um, but the one the where it comes into play a little bit is when we, we get to the point where we want to try and help people at the time of death. And one of the things we can do for others at the time of death is puts a, 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 a stupa on their crown. Because what yeah. you're trying to do with that or something virtuous, there's also sand you can get from special initiations, Kala Chakra initiations that His Holiness yeah. has given. So, or any kind of holy substance you want to put on the crown, because you want to direct their consciousness up through the crown. If you're going to help someone and you put something with a power, you know, a spiritual power on their crown through the death process, that supports the, it's to try and move the consciousness up through the crown. So that's maybe where that becomes useful to know, you right. know why we're doing that, because you want to get their, that's the best way someone can leave really is through the crown. That's right. about the best rebirth. Um, I was I got information somewhere um, from a Dharma source of of pulling the hair at the top yes. of the crown, right? Yes, that's also something else you can do. Um, it's a tricky one because you really need to know the right time when to do it. Um, right. It's just about when they pass because after that you don't you know there's a time when you shouldn't be touching the body, so you kind of really need to be there right on when the the breath the gross breathing stops, right. um, and then you put the crown. And then you can pull the hair. Yeah, it's to kind of push, force the consciousness up. But that one's tricky because the timing's a little bit not easy with that one. It's not right. Easy because you're not supposed to touch the body. So the main one we want to do is um, 
putting something, once the breathing stops, is putting a stupa on the crown, which we will get to. I'm realising we're almost at an hour here. So just for the sake of kind of hopefully trying to get through these five powers, I'm going to move on to that. If you have any other questions, please write them down or comments or whatever, because then maybe during the practice day or the question, you know, next week, if you were interested to come for the hour of discussion, we can talk about them then as well. But just to try and finish off with this, these five tower, uh, powers. So during this, yeah, anyway, we're just going to move on from there. So the five powers at the time of death. So again, this might be getting into your, a little bit of your question, Ladan. You know, how do we really make the most of this death process? You know, <laughs> what can we do? And I think for us at our level, these are the most important things that we need to do to prepare, not just at the death time, to, but to practice throughout our lives. So they're very they have a power, you know, they support us at the death time, you know, that's what we're doing, we're just familiar with them. So these five powers at the time of death is the power of the white seed, power of intention, power of countering negativity, the power of prayer and the power of familiarity. So the first one, the power of the white seed. So again, this is what we're practicing at the death time, but we really need to be practicing it now because you can't just like, it's like anything, you can't kind of turn up to any situation unprepared, you know. So, of course, the whole lamb rim is a death preparation for death time. That whole inner transformation that we get through practicing lamb rim, the gradual path to enlightenment, everything is ultimately preparing us for the death time. But in terms of this particular module, you know, we talked about how remembering death now and its uncertainty develops this minded attachment. You know, so as much as we can, one of the strongest ways to remember, to, to develop a minded detachment, work on our attachment and our necessary attachments to this life, to people, friends, situations, emotions, everything is to remember death, you know, de that we're going, you know, uncertainty at the time of death and that we are, you know, we are going to face death, you know, so that keeps our mind light less attached to this life. So the power of the white seed, we need that at the death time because absolutely we don't want to be uh, um, grasping at our friends and our family and our, you know, we need to, we need to practice that now. Doesn't mean we don't love friends, family, we don't love people around us, but it needs to, we need to have this kind of purity of non-attachment. We need to do, if we have that developed now, it'll be much easier to go at the death time won't be attached to our body, our possessions, our friends. We'll be able to let go at the time when we need to go through this process. So that's first power we need to rely on now and also at the time of death. The next one is intention. So again, we cover this a bit more in the next module as well. But the main one is, you know, at the time of death and also in our daily life to have a very always that in positive sense of, sense of intention, you know, to develop in our daily life, you know, positive. That's why we start off with the morning motivation. Uh, one of the most important things, whatever we're doing in our life, especially to start off a day, to develop a positive motivation at the beginning of the day. Ideally one that's kind of imbued with a sense of wanting to be of service to others, to make our life meaningful in the Dharma, make our life meaningful for ourselves and others. To, so to just to, to have that on a daily basis, so that when we go into the death process, we also are able to kind of feel like, well, well, we'll see the, the motivation that Rimshi says, the best thing to have at the death time is just to feel like, well, you know, even when I die, may it be offset, may it be for others, you know, might the process be for others, dying with a good heart, dying with a good motivation. So that much more we can develop a, a, our intention, our motivation for life, then it's going to be easy at the death time, you know, it's going to be there naturally. The power of countering negativity. So again, this is daily life and at the death time. So it's a little, this will be a bit tricky, this one. This is probably the number one. That experience suffering in cycle existence due to self-cherishing. The root of self-cherishing comes from conceiving that beings and things inherently exist, whereas they do not. 
what this really means is, in a nutshell, is it's about, so in our daily life, one of the things that we need to do is kind of, it's always about trying to own our own stuff. <laughs> Taking kind of responsibility for our own stuff. So certainly as we move through the Lam Rim and the different topics and when we move into karma, we start to understand, well, why does stuff happen to us? <laughs> and the more we understand karma, the more that we start to see, well, it happens to us because of the we've created. It's not just about this life. You know, we have beginningless life karmas <laughs> that we have to face, you know. And if we're not purified, if we haven't worked on it, then we have to face the, the karmic consequences for them, you know. And that comes in this life through difficult relationships, through health problems, through you know, harm challenges in our environment through unexpected kind of disasters or problems that happen in our life. It's due, what the Buddha would say is that it's the result of our karma. So some of us already have a sense of that right now, but it's a very deep contemplation, you know, to really think about whatever challenges have happened in my, I mean, great, all the good stuff comes from my karma. Well, that's easy. We want, we can accept that. But even the difficult stuff, you know, so that much more we can attribute the challenges in our life, the inner and outer challenges and obstacles to being a, a kind of manifestation of karma um, up into even like understanding that everything that appears is sort of coming from our mind. It's a, it's a reflection of our own consciousness right now. So taking that on board gives a certain power to the mind. As Reba Rinpoche said, you know, as soon as you blame others for your problems, you lose your refuge. Reba Rinpoche, he was allowed to say that <laughs> because I don't know, did anyone, I guess probably no one here has met Reba Rinpoche. Has anyone ever had teachings, uh, listened to any teachings for Reba Rinpoche or knows a little bit about Reba Rinpoche? Anyone here? Urs maybe? Did you ever receive teachings for Reba Rinpoche Urs? I mean, I recognise the name, but I happen to see. Yeah, him. I mean, he did pass away some years ago. I was very fortunate to meet him. So he was a high lama who experienced the devastation in Tibet directly. He was imprisoned for something like 20 years and tortured by Chinese. And because that's what they did with lamas at that time, you know, they imprisoned them and tortured them. So he went through, I think, something like 20 or 25 years of prison and torture imprisonment and torture in Tibet and he was eventually released so he can say that <laughs> you know because he practiced that in that situation and I wasn't present at the time but I heard from some dharma friends that one time he was at I'm sure it was more than one time but he one time when he was at Vajrapani he was asked to a little bit explain what happened to him in the prisons and the translator could barely speak for crying to what abuse, you know, what he had to go through. But again, like he and many great lamas of his time who experienced or st are still experiencing Tibet, their main fear was losing their compassion in that situation. You know, so you know, when you think about situations like that, our problems become like small potatoes kind of thing, you know, really. But that's why these beings can practice with, you know, they can die with such um, power, you know, They're, the mind, they, they, because they've practiced this kind of not blaming others for their stuff, for whatever happens to them. And again, that's a whole system of what we call lojong, you know, thought transformation in this, t this tradition. But the idea is to kind of always bring whatever comes back to you to, to work with inwardly and not push the blame out there because that disempowers us. It disempowers our mind, you know. It's not easy and we're not going to be able to do it in a minute. <laughs> Some of us might, I don't know, you know, we might be well trained already. But that's why we have all these thought transformation praxis. So that's the main one. The negativity is about how it's really about developing the power to work with negativity in your life so that it benefits you, you know, benefits your heart and mind. You transform it into bodhicitta, wisdom, uh, wisdom and compassion. 
So the, the other power in this life and then in the you know in the at the time of death is the power of prayer. Using the power of prayer. So again, this is really about very much about um we could say in, in sense of de always dedicating using dedication to dedicate all our positive energy that we develop all the time at the end of the day, um, doing prayers and dedications to to um, kind of guide our life in a certain way, you know, guide and protect all the positivity that we've ac accumulated in our lives. Um, so to to protect that and make and kind of bring it in a direction towards our enlightenment, towards positivity for our death time. So Lamazo Parimshi again and his, I mean, even in this life, I mean, some of us here were present at Rimshi's teachings. Rimshi would spend, in terms of the power of intention, Rimshi would spend like sometimes the whole teaching just on a motivation. We never got to the topic. The whole teaching was the motivation, right? <laughs> um, who, who of us, Earth, right? The whole teaching became the motivation. And then we maybe spent 10 minutes on what actually the topic was, and then the rest 45 minutes. So I always knew. For many years, certainly before Rimshi manifested the stroke, we knew at least there was going to be 45 minutes of motivation. And then I always knew, OK, we've got about another 45 minutes to hours to go because Rimshi would start the dedications because they would take about 45 minutes to an hour. It wasn't just Jan Chu, Senjo, Rinpoche, you know, two minutes. Rimshi would spend like 45 minutes and you kind of, OK, I have to keep my eyes open. I have to try and stay awake for another 45 minutes. I know that it's going to end in about 45 minutes because Rimshi started the dedication. So, so again, for us, we can't practice like that. But the importance of kind of dedicating our prayers, you know, in a way that's going to help us, not just, mostly for future lives, you know, mostly all these dedications are going into future lives. So relying on that power of prayer and dedication. Because that all, again, this is all empowering the mind at the death time. The last one is the power of familiarity. So again, it's not something separate as such. It's just like anything. I mean, what does gone mean? It means become familiar to familiarize, GOM is meditation. So again, ideally, we get to a point that everything in our life is a type of meditation, our whole life is a meditation, whether we're in meditation or out of meditation, it's like we're, we're developing virtuous states of mind and becoming familiar with them on and off the cushion. So relying on that power of familiarity. So again, at the death time, it's easy, you know, we know what we're doing, we're familiar. We've become familiar with the mind states of bodhicitta and to an extent emptiness, karma, you know, um, these states of mind are familiar to us. So we know how to, we can bring them some sort of virtuous mind up at this time of death. We can bring our bodhicitta motivation up at the time of death. There's less fear, you know. Our mind's imbued with these five powers and that what that's what takes us through the death process. So again, for great meditators, they just, you know, they know, okay, they, they have control of the death process and that they either sit down or they, may, they they lie down in this lying posture. And as the Buddha did, um, he, you know, and say, you know, they, they, they're going to pass away. Now, so for the Buddha, mostly we would say, you know, it's not ideal to have people around you when you pass. It depends on the type of people. But the, for the Buddha and great holy beings, it doesn't really matter so much. They have so much ability and control at the death time so they can have you know any amount of beings around them at the death time they already are able to very clearly and powerfully go into that death process so where are we here i don't know maybe I, after practicing the other forms of mind um, yeah so if you so one, yeah, one way that you can do, so of course, so this is for ordinary beings. These are the five powers that are generally for us, not just sort of for all, even holy beings. I mean, they always, they rely on these five powers, of course, you know, but for us, um, that's what it says, you know, there's there's a process called POA or POA or POA, sorry, P-O-W-A or mind transference. But that's not always certain that you're going to be able to do that, practice that at the death time. But if you familiarized yourself with these five powers, 
then due to that, you're able to have a you're able to have a virtuous mindset at the time of death, if you've practiced them throughout your life. So there's one. So in terms of maybe not being able to practice po at the time of death, there's a story of about an old monk. He practiced all his life to um, become a to 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 transfer his consciousness. So he'd meditated on. He was trying to transfer his consciousness to Tashita. So I'm assuming he was doing a practice with Maitreya Buddha all his life. And his, 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 he was training so that at the time of death, he would go to the, you know, he would be able to transfer his consciousness to the pure land of Tashita. So as I say, this process is called Po, and some of you have heard it already. So anyway, as the time was coming for him to pass away, he sat up in the meditation posture. He told his students to leave and that he was going to. And so the students brought him a cup of butter tea. And that's often quite common, you know, in the Tibetan tradition to bring your teacher, to offer your some, to teacher something, leave it there, you know, before they pass away. However, he was having, it seemed like he was having some difficulty to transfer his consciousness. It wasn't happening the way he wanted to because he was getting attached to the butter tea. This is the story. So again, maybe the power of the white seed, that first power detachment wasn't as strong as he thought it was. So there was some attachment going on to the uh, to the butter tea. There was some something going on. So anyway, the students could see that there wasn't something wasn't happening peacefully with his death process. So they called one of his teachers in and the teacher was able to see that he was having a problem because there was some attachment still to this tea. So the teacher whispered in his ear, there's better butter tea in Tushita. And this was able, this allowed the old monk to let go and he was able to transform his consciousness to the pure man. So this is a kind of old Tibetan story about the things that can happen at the death time, even when you've done so much practice, it's not always the case that you're able to do the poor practice. And there's many other stories like these monks had, you know, they, they thought they were going to be able to meditate on the death process, but because the body, um, because of the condition of the body, also if the body's very sick at the death time, it's always not, it's often not very easy to do these practices. So the one that you can always rely on is this what we call the practice of bodhicitta. You know, just as much as we've developed that goodness, that compassion in this life, at least we could say the minimum, may my, you know, may, I'm going to die for others, you know, may this be of service to others, even in the death time. Just developing the strong mind, of wanting to benefit others, even in the death time and in the future lives. That's the one that we can really rely on the most, especially when other ones may not work, even though we've practiced we may not be able to really do them at the point of death because there's other interferences external or internal that happen that we didn't we would we didn't expect we don't know that's going to happen especially like certain sicknesses that can happen that make it more difficult to do these very very subtle meditations so again like so there are but again there are these pure land practices so we can absolutely throw there are opportunities. So if one, if for some of us who have taken initiations already, that's really what we're doing, you know. Uh, Tara, Medicine Buddha, High Shoga Tantra initiations, by reciting prayers and mantras in connection with these certain Buddhas, we can create a karma to be born in pure lands. So it's not necessarily that, and again, these are places we go, ideally, where there's no more suffering, you know. So when you're born in these pure lands, you're born into a place where you no longer have these gross aggregates. You're born where you don't have this the level the level of suffering that we have now, sickness, birth, old age. We're not under the control of these, so it's much more easy to complete our practice in these purer places. Um, and these pure lands manifest from the bodhicitta, the compassion of these holy beings. They manifest so that beings like ourselves, if we have the karma, purity, karma in mind, and we've made prayers and aspirations and done the praxis in this life, we can create the karma to go to those pure lands, as opposed to being reborn again into kind of ordinary cyclic existence in one of the realms of samsara. So there's definitely, we have, this is what all these Chinrizig, Medicine Buddha, 
um, Tara practice, and again, there's High Yoga Vajra Yogini, Amitabha practice. They all have their own pure lands, and it's it's kind of like up to our level of consciousness, our level of mind, whether or not we're in our connection we make with these practices, this life, our familiarity with them, our purity heart, whether or not we have the karma at the death time to be born then. But there's definitely these practices we can do. And even if we can't bring our minds to those levels, if we have, if we're very fortunate to have a holy being <laughs> who's guiding us, who's taking care of us at the death time, they may be able to do, to do poor practices for us so that they can take our consciousness to those pure lands. Or if you have a, a very strong, even if your guru's not there, but you have a very strong connection with a spiritual teacher who has that power, and you call upon them at the death time, they 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 can due to the power of your sort of devotion and faith and um and also your own karma and the abilities of that guru, they they're able to also potentially take you to those places where we can more quickly develop all the qualities and stages of the path up to enlightenment. That's the purpose of these pure lands. So we don't have to come down to these grosser learn, uh, realms. So again, these are just some of the places and the practices that we can do now to be able to go to those places at the death time. So just to finish, um, so what we can do at the death time, either for ourselves or others, so some of these are available on the FPMT store. Um, and again, we can answer more questions with this next week and we can also do a little bit more in the practice day. But this is a sort of package that you used to buy on our store. You could order it. But I think now you have to order them separately on the store. But as I mentioned about the stupa, so this is a liberation box that you can order online. And as a stupa, it has this Kala Chakra Sand. It has mantras that you can place on the body at the death time. It has the instructions. So Rinpoche's book... That's the one I would really, really recommend if no one, if, if you want to buy something, is How to Enjoy Death. Venerable Rubina um, put it together wonderfully with all the collections of what happens at the death time, the five, the five powers to practice, um, what you can do to support others. The different practices are all in there. I mean, it's like a Bible. <laughs> And actually, it was, it was published like that. It's like, it looks like a Bible, you know, it's, it's maroon in colour. And it's called, I mean, of course, it's like it's called How to Enjoy Death, you know, how for yourself and others you can benefit them the most at the death time. So it's really, it's, it's really a good one to buy. And it's very easy to, it's very readable. And it covers what we are talking about here because there's quite a lot of information to take in. So I really suggest to look through that and maybe get familiar with that because that's how that gives you clear instructions how you can help people at the death time. And when's the time to put these things on the body? So we sell these. This was also produced. It's a cover. It's a beautiful silk cover that was made by one of Rimshi's students, a monk from Singapore. Uh, Venerable Jarchom. Uh, Rinpoche wanted to uh, produce this sort of silk blanket or cover to put on those who, when they've passed away, when the breathing stops. And again, mantras to help support them through this subtlety of the death process and support the consciousness. So it ideally goes to a positive future rebirth um, and not to fall into the lower realms. All these mantras on here have a power um, to sort of guide the the, uh, the being through the bardo into a positive rebirth and to help us not be born in so what we call the lower realms um, into a, you know, a more challenging rebirth. So that can be also placed on the body at the time of death. And we sell them in the shop here. They sell them at Land of Medicine Buddha. Um, so that's, um, and I even gave one to my mum and she was very happy. She's happy to be, she's not a Buddhist, but she said she's very happy to have it placed on her bed, body at the death time. So I was really, I was very chuffed about that. <laughs> so again, helping, why is it, so helping others at the time of death is the best thing that we can offer them because the death time is so important for the, the mindset that's going to ripen. You know, what, what mindset ripens is what's at the time of death is what's guiding our future rebirth. So that much more we familiar with the five powers, with these minds of bodhicitta, compassion, kindness, using our death to benefit others. You know, whatever positive mindsets we're more familiar with at this during lifetime, that more likely we're able to 
bring them to mind at the death time. And that's what's going to guide our future rebirth. What's going on with our mental state? Mostly that's what's guiding us um, in our future rebirth, the mindset at the time of death. And also, not just for ourselves, but for others, providing the right support, the right environment. And again, a lot of this is in Rinpoche's book, you know, how we can really help others through that process. So again, even just before people die, you know, if you, the, the, I think we know some of this already, you know. Um, first of all, being emotionally strong ourselves. And again, that much more we're prepared for our own death, that much more we're prepared for others. If people need that kind of support, helping them to find forgiveness and generate a positive state of mind and creating a, a nice environment around them, a peaceful environment. The mind is the most important one, but also having a sort of a peaceful environment really um, is very helpful at the time of death as well. I mean, I think we can all appreciate that. So again, here's some of Rimshi's advice as well. Um, how to benefit the like dying and dead, but it's also in the um, How to Enjoy Death book by Lama Zopa Rimshi as well. Again, just using the death process as a way to feel like may this, even this process, may this may be benefiting others. Just, just offering everything to be of the service to others, just at least to have that basic mind and body cheat as much as possible. As Rim, she says, I'm experiencing on behalf of all sentient beings. So <clears throat> I've only I've been around someone who passed away a couple of times. The last time was um, with a friend called Jack. He was a Dharma practitioner. And Rinpoche was still with us at that time. So he was giving advice how to help Jack because a few of us were around Jack when he, um, he, just before he passed and then at the actual time of passing. And one of the main things Rinpoche gave, the main practice that we had to read to Jack um, in these last two or three days was this practice of Ton Len, which basically means all, because he was, he was in quite a lot of pain. He died of, I think, bone cancer. So it's very, very, very painful way to die. So Rimshi was just encouraging us um, who sat by him to just as much as possible remind, remind, remember the mind of body cheetah and whatever is pain we were ex he was experiencing, it takes trying to have this heart that we're experiencing it for all sentient beings. So it's very, it was very powerful, it's very moving. So that was the main advice that Rimshi gave at that time to, to make the main practice for Jack was his tonline practice, taking on all the suffering, all sentient beings. And again, these are other practices again that are uh, written out on the in the book. To there's a mantra that can be recited in the person's ear once they pass away. First thing to do is to just as they're passing is to recite this mantra. It's very powerful for liberating from lower rebirth. And then there's other practices that we can do when we're around the person and or, or just after the past, like Medicine Buddha Mantra, the King of Prayers, the Eight Prayers of the Death, 10 Powerful Mantras. And again, these are all available either on FPMT um, through our shop, um, online shop, or again, they're all in this book, How to Enjoy Death. So again, that was a little bit quick at the end there, but maybe we can bring up some questions if you have any. Um, maybe we can do one question now before we finish or one comment. Um, before um, yeah, before we finish, because it's I realise it's nearly eight thirty now, and I did have to run through that a little bit. <laughs> Stan, yes. I'm sorry. This is not a question about the teachings, but about the schedule. I take it that this is our last, our final official class time. Yes. We have the discussion next week, and then we have the practice time. Yes. And that'll be the end of our sessions uh, for yes. this module. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. I am unable to attend the Sunday practice time. Will any of it be uh, on online or just in person? Um, B? Yeah, it will be online too. Oh, I yeah, it's, on, mm -hmm. it's online. Yeah. And we'll have a recording as well for, for the practice day. Okay, good. Because I have to work and I, I can't um, be there. But um, 
I hope to be able to catch some of that um, mm -hmm. at some point. Thank you. But no, no recording for the study group. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, it went through a little bit fast at the end, but I felt I had to go through all that material. Um, any other questions or comments? I know from Robin, she's shaking her head. Terry, maybe not. <laughs> no. I mean, some of it I think you've heard already, you know. So it's just, and I mean, some of these practices we might not be familiar with yet. Um, but again, that the book from Rimshu, How to Enjoy Death, is it's a it's a wonderful resource for how you can help others at the death time. Um, the other thing I wasn't able to cap, catch here, so we'll catch it in the either during the practice day I might mention it is the um the karma, different karmas that can ripen at the death time and how that happens. I think that was part of Ladan's question. Did what did I answer part of your question, Ladan, that you asked earlier? Was any of it in there? Yes, yeah, yeah, part of it, but uh, yeah, you you answered it. But I'm thirsty of more. <laughs> <laughs> more in terms of, yeah, more of the details, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there is a lot more details. It's just without doing about another three classes and going into more detail, I, I don't know if, you know, there is a lot more details. You can certainly get it in some of the reading. And as I say, how to enjoy death as well. Um, there are... there are. I have a question, a small question. Mm -hmm. Even... If, uh, even if the person that is dying not at all familiar with Buddhism or all of yeah. this, we can do all these things to them. Maybe, yeah, well, you can do those maybe things. Maybe they don't want. <laughs> I don't know if they're. Well, you know, that's part of the advice that comes up. The best thing to do for someone at the death time is, if they already have a spiritual practice is for someone to do what works for, you know, what they're comfortable with. I mean, if it's mm -hmm. Christian or whatever you'd want to do, you have to check with the person what they're really going to be comfortable with. Uh -huh. I mean, personally, you can do all these practices somewhere else, you know, mm -hmm. but if you're with the person half of them. at the death time, you're not going to want to sit and do Buddhist prayers if that's not what they're they what they would like you know the best thing is to do what they would like the main thing is to have a peaceful environment not not people who are clinging and grasping because that can also upset the person you know if you've oh, got emotional God. people around and crying you want to have a very peaceful environment you want to have if prayers if that person's happy with prayers being recited I mean some of my friends when their family pass away, they may just sit with the person and do prayers very quietly, you know, because, the you know, that's not mess. But still, I mean, if my family pass away, I might do something very quietly around and they would be OK with that. For Dharma practitioners, Lama Soparimshi said we can say prayers quite loudly because that's something that they're familiar, that's going to make them feel happy, you know. So so you just have to gauge the situation. But certainly, um, if the person's happy, you could put something, you know, you could put the, the stoop on the crown of the head, you could put the blank on. I've already asked my mother, she's, she's happy with that if I'm there at the time. So it's good to ask these things ahead of time if you're not going to, going to be supporting someone through the death process. What they would like and not like and there um, around them you know what they're comfortable with um, and then of course anyway we can do these up to 49 days we can do some of these practices for them the medicine buddha the, the main ones that rimshi advises are the medicine buddha practice and the king of prayers and some of these other prayers for the dead so because of, of course a lot we might not be able to do a lot but the medicine buddha practice or puja is a powerful one that rimshi suggests and also the king of prayers takes about 15 20 minutes that's also one. That, these are the main ones Rimshi suggests. And if we can do more, that's wonderful. You can get, you can um, offer money to monastics or in the East to get prayers done for your families as well. You know, family members, friends that pass away. But that much more we have a karmic connection with someone, that much more we're going to be able to benefit them as well. So there is a lot more to this. So please, any questions, bring next week. I just knew this tonight was going to be a... <laughs> Sort of fin wanted to just touch on all these materials, so I felt like I got them covered, you know. So, but next week there will be a chance if it, if you're able to attend, and of course on the practice day as well. And if you've got any other questions, put them on WhatsApp or you know I'm always available by email as well. But Thank as again, so that, 
that resource, how to enjoy death, is wonderful for asking for going into detail with more questions. But it's a it's a big topic. It's a big topic. It's fascinating as well. I mean, it's wonderful that we have this amount of knowledge available for us to be able to benefit people at the death time. You know, we can do a lot to help others when they pass away. You know, so it's really great. Okay. I guess for some of us, it's back to the elections. <laughs> that uncertainty, oh my gosh. Anyway, <laughs> so let's just pray that whatever happens is the most beneficial <laughs> for America. That's mm -hmm. all we can do, you know. Because mm -hmm. um, it's really, it's kind of out of our hands almost now, really, isn't it? I'm just going to share a couple of the Tibetan prayers uh, so we can see them at the end as well. So yeah, um, either way, just by doing this class, um, may it be the cause for each one of us to have, to get to grips a little bit more with the death process, understand that more deeply, and also be able to prepare in our, for death in a way by practicing these five powers in our daily life, you know, uh, purity of mind, you know, more non-attachment, more awareness of death and its uncertainty, more familiarity with this mind of bodhicitta, the good heart. That's the main one that protects and guides us through the death process. And even on top of that, if we're able to develop a deeper understanding of emptiness and the subtle nature of consciousness, and maybe utilize that at the time of death, how wonderful that would be, you know? So just dedicating that for ourselves, for others, uh, through listening and reflecting and meditating on these classes and practices. May we all have a good death. And also may the elections in the US happen as easily, gracefully as possible. And um, may whatever result happen be of the best benefit for America, for the world, for all sentient beings. And may that president be guided always by sincerity, goodness of heart, and the right wisdom with the mind of bodhicitta. May that always be prevalent in their hearts when they make these big decisions for us and for the world. Chanju Senju Rimbo She Magi Panangi Gyur She Ye Banyamba Me Bai Gone Gondu Pelwar Shu May the precious Supreme Body Cheat, precious Supreme Body Cheat, are not yet born arise. May that arise and not decline, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness not yet born arise. May that arise and not decline, but increase more and more. And we'll pray for His Holiness's long life. Incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And for the long life of each of us and for all beings, practicing goodness and virtue, the good heart, benefit in others in this world, may they all, all those live a long life. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for joining. <laughs> thank well you. done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe we'll see some of you Thanks next so week. And if not at the practice day, yep. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. May all be good for America. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm going to say, you know, may it be the best. <laughs> uh, yep. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Erzenbe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.